As they're finding their way down to their classes, I'm really excited. In two weeks is our Resurrection Sunday service. And uh, um, we are going to be having some guests with us. A lot of our, well, hopefully we'll see a lot of our construction zone children that we do uh, during the holidays, whether it's Christmas or Easter. We'll be singing on the platform. And so we're excited to have all of the children up on the platform uh, singing for us in a couple Sundays on that Easter Resurrection Sunday. Uh, parents will be here, maybe some grandparents. So be prepared. You might want to come a little early to get your seat because it's usually a full house. And uh, I just love seeing those kids sing. They've been practicing on Wednesday nights. And so uh, they have one more Wednesday night practice. And that's coming up this week because the week of spring break, there will not be the Wednesday uh, evening ministries during spring break. So uh, just kind of want to remind you about that to all the parents and grandparents who are bringing their children. Um, this morning, I really look forward to sharing the word with you. I do every Sunday morning. Uh, on the way out, when people greet me, uh, you know, our common greeting to each other is, how you doing? After I'm done preaching, I'm doing really good. I have to because, you know, it, it's something that's in my heart and I love to share. How many like to just share something good with other people? You know, um, it, it goes to the whole area of our life. I mean, if you found a good deal, guess what? You want to share it with somebody. Um, unless you want to go back, you want to make sure you get a second trip before they go, right? right. <laughs> um, but uh, we love to share good news. We've got good news today. We've been singing about Jesus all morning long. What wonderful good news. If you're not moved during worship, we need to talk. I tell you what, I've just been moved in my spirit. Uh, when we get to heaven, what we heard this morning from our congregations before the Lord is going to be magnified over and over and over again when we're in the presence of the King. And uh, so I just, uh, I just was really blessed this morning from worship and trust that you are as well. And uh, yes, in a couple weeks, we're going to be on Resurrection Sunday. We have Good Friday first, and, and uh, we'll be... Uh, remembering his death, the great sacrifice that was given through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. But uh, I, I want to share with you a passage of scripture this morning as we begin in our text, one that every single person in this room should know. By the way, uh, it's just in black and white today, but you know, those are taking notes. It doesn't matter, does it? Uh, you'll be able to see it quite clearly this morning. Uh, but John 3, 16, I think most of us could know it by heart. You know, people take their posters and they have John 3.16 at the football games and the stadiums and the parades. We see it plastered all over the place. But do we truly know what the meaning of the verse is? This morning, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture. We're going to talk a little bit about it because we are talking about God's love. We've been singing about it this morning. God's love is there for you today if you receive it, if you accept his love, it will change your life. People today say, I just need a change in my life. I don't like the way my life is headed. There's things about my life I just don't, I, I know that they're not good for me. It's not, it's not helpful to me. And I encourage you this morning to come and embrace the love of God. For God so loved you. You. God loved you. That this world, he said, God so loved the world, and I put you in there, of course, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray that it will speak to our hearts today in a way that only the Holy Spirit can as we open our hearts to you. And I encourage you as I pray, open your heart to the Lord today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. John 3.16 was the verse through which D.L. Moody learned to appreciate the greatness of God's love. Moody had been to England in the early days of his ministry and there had met a young English preacher named Henry Morehouse. One day Morehouse said to Moody, I'm thinking of going to America. 
Well, said Moody, if you should ever come to Chicago, come down to my church and we'll give you a chance to preach. Moody did not mean to be hypocritical when he said this, of course. He was merely being polite. Have you ever just said things because you're being polite? You're just being polite. I don't think he really expected it to happen. Nevertheless, he was saying to himself that he hoped maybe that Morehouse would not come, but for Moody had not heard him even preach. Now, that's scary. I, I like to hear someone preach a little bit, you know. He had no idea what he would say if he should ever come to Chicago. Sometime later, after Moody had returned home, the evangelist received a telegram that said, I have just arrived in New York. I will be to Chicago on Sunday. <laughs> Guess who's going to preach? <laughs> Morehouse. <laughs> Moody was perplexed about what he should do, and to complicate matters, he was just about to leave for a series of meetings elsewhere. Oh, my, he thought. Here I am about to be gone on Sunday, and Morehouse is coming and I have promised to let him preach. Finally, he said to his wife and to the leaders of the church, I think that I should let him preach once. So let him preach once. Then if the people enjoy him, put him on again. Moody was gone for a week. When he returned, he said to his wife, how did the young preacher do? Oh, he is a better preacher than you are, his wife said. <laughs> He is telling sinners that God loves them. Well, that is not right, said Moody. God does not love sinners. Well, you never thought Moody would say stuff like that, did you? Well, this is the early days. You mean to tell me that he is still preaching? Yes, he is preaching all week, and he, is, he has only one verse all week long for his text. It is John 3, 16. Moody actually then decided, I'd better go to the meeting. <laughs> Morehouse got up and began by saying, I have been hunting for a text all week long, and I have not been able to find a better text than John 3.16. So I think we will just talk about it once more. And so he did. Afterward, Moody said, it was on that night that he clearly understood the greatness of God's love. One of the songs that we've been singing this morning, one of my favorites, Danny, is Amazing Love. How can it be? How can it be that he would love you and me? When we're little, we learn the chorus. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Right? You know the song? You wanted to keep going, didn't you? <laughs> Caught you. <laughs> You're listening. <laughs> yes, learned it when we were little, how much he loves us. But as we get older in life, we begin to understand even more fully how much the Son Jesus loves us, how much God the Father loves us for sending His Son Jesus, and it forever impacts our life, and our life is never the same. Maybe today your life needs to change. I come, I bring you to the Father. I bring you to God this morning, the one who loves you, his love is truly and overwhelming and a subject that we could speak on just like Morehouse did for days. It's even hard to tackle it in even one service to tackle the greatness of his love. I was reminded again of the scriptures this week that reminded me that nothing in this world will ever separate me from the love of God my Father. I mean, you're going through some stuff right now. You're going through some valleys, going through a dark time. You guys all know what it means to go through dark times, times of trial and trouble. God, where are you? Can I remind you again that nothing will ever separate you from the love of God? And even in the darkest and the lowest of times in our life, the love of God is still there for you and for me. 
You see, Jesus took it all on the cross, and he understands what you feel at times. Even greater does he understand when on the cross he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I can tell you this. Our Heavenly Father will never forsake you. On that moment when He died on that cross, when He gave up His Spirit, and you know, we're, we're going to be talking more about this in the weeks to come as we get into the season that we celebrate. His resurrection is... There was that moment of, Lord, where are you? You're letting me die here. And He did it, though, for you. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross... But there's just one sentence we're looking at this morning. Are you looking for a lot of Scripture references today? This will be one day. All you got to write down is John 3.16. I might mention more. I usually do. But John 3.16, let's look at it. You know, it depends on your translation. Translation I read to you, there's 24 words. 24 words, but it is packed with so much. Now, don't get too excited when I got seven things I'm going to share with you. Because you're like, oh boy, let's see how many minutes per point. And, and let's see how long we're going to be here. You know, I'm a very analytical person. And uh, by the way, we, uh, those of you, there are many of you that joined us at our uh, Let's Talk Marriage thing at the Brentwood. And it was so much fun to, for Julie and I to, to share that evening. Had a wonderful meal and just wonderful time together. And... Uh, I was putting together the notes for the evening for Julie and I, and she says, look what you did here. I put times on there. You know why? Because how many know you can get stuck on something and you don't move on? So I had to put a time. Okay, we're going to start at this time, and this point we should be at this point, just to keep us on track. Today, you're out of luck. I didn't put time on this. Okay? You're going to get what you get. And uh, some of these points I might move on quite quickly. Some I might take a little bit more time. But we're going to look at this. And my prayer is, is that you're going to have an understanding of John 3, 16 in a way that you'll be able to share the God, of, the God of love to others. How many want to share his love to others? This good news. Right out of the gate, here's the first one. God's love is unconditional. For God so loved the world. Let's think about that for a moment. The word world, the translation from the original Greek language, some of you know this word, If I and I'm going to mention it to you. Oh, okay. The word is cosmos. You ever heard that word before? But in the Greek culture, and in the way that they understood it in the day of the Jewish people, the word actually had a reference to an ungodly multitude. For God so loved an ungodly multitude. And guess what? We're all in that number. What's the hymn say? Just as I am, without one plea, right? He saved a wretch like me. We all know we're in that group. The whole mass of men alienated from God and before coming to Christ, we were, as the Scripture says, alienated from Him, separate, hostile to the cause of Christ. This is the world that God looked down upon in the fullness of time and sent his son Jesus to die. He didn't just come to save people that were good people. You know, we all got ideas about, oh, they're really good people, they're really nice people. No, he came to save all people. He came to see the, Jew, the Jews. He came to the, the, the Gentiles, that's all of us. Uh, he, he loves the saints, yes, he says, he does that, but for God so loved the world, all of us. That means today when we look at our world, how many you know that God loves even the ugliest and the evilest of people? The grace of God. That's why he says, love your enemies. We were an enemy of the cross. And God said, I'm going to send my son for those enemies. Those that don't know me. 
And so this is the mystery of his love. The mystery of his love. And at times we can fail to recognize who our maker truly is. And sometimes we think that he must be a God up there is ready to just zap us. How many of you think if you were God, you'd probably zap yourself <laughs> by now? You know, because of stuff you said, done, it's like, you know, God's grace is so incredible that he is so long-suffering with us, not willing any to perish, but to all should come to what? Repentance. Have you been there? Are you there today? Oh, this morning. God's love isn't based on your spiritual condition this morning. Doesn't matter how you came in this door, in your spiritual condition, God's love is ready for you today to receive. Your behavior, your attitude. Oh, come on, we have attitudes, don't we, sometimes? God's love is universal, unconditional, And it sets itself apart against all other religions in the world. There is only one way to heaven, and it's Jesus. For he himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There was, at one point, a religious conference where they were comparing among supposedly wise scholars. How many think people think they're wise when they're sometimes foolish? Well, they were having a spirited debate. What is unique about Christianity? What's unique about it? Someone suggested that Christianity was set apart from other religions because of the concept of incarnation, the idea that God could take the form in Jesus. But someone quickly Interjected. Well, actually, other faiths believe that God appears in human form. Another suggestion was offered. Well, what about the resurrection? The belief that death is not the final word. That the tomb was found empty. Someone slow, slowly shook his head. Other religions have accounts of people returning from the dead. Then as the story of this conference unfolds, talks about a gentleman that appeared in the room. Many of you know who I'm going to mention. C.S. Lewis walked into the room. Get him. <laughs> yes. With his tweed jacket, arms full of papers, and he even came a little early for his presentation, but now here he is. He sat down and took in all this conversation which had by now evolved into a fierce debate. All these religious leaders. Finally, during a lull in the conversation, he spoke by saying, what's all this rumpus about? Everyone turned in his direction. Trying to explain themselves, they said, we're debating the uniqueness about Christianity. Oh, he says, that's easy. It's grace. The room fell silent. Lewis continued that Christianity uniquely claims God's love comes free of charge, no strings attached. No other religion makes that claim. After a moment, someone commented that Lewis had a point. Well, the Buddhists, for example, follow an eightfold path to enlightenment. It's not a free ride. Hindus believe in karma, that your actions actually affect the way that the world will treat you. That there is nothing that comes to you not set in motion by your actions. Someone else observed the Jewish code of the law, implying that God has requirements for people to be acceptable to him. And in Islam, God is a God of judgment, not a God of love. You live to, ple you live to appease him. At the end of the discussion, everyone concluded... Lewis had a point. Only Christianity dares to proclaim God's love is unconditional. An unconditional love that we call what? Grace, he says. So we boldly proclaim that grace really has precious little to do with us 
our inner resolve, our lack of other things in our lives. Rather, grace is all about God, how he freely gives to us gifts of forgiveness, mercy, and love. Isn't that the truth this morning? Aren't you thankful that you have been presented in your life the good news of Jesus Christ and God's love? I'm so thankful for missionaries. If you've been with us since the first of the year, we've had two young missionary couples come and share their hearts. It was a joy just recently at our sectional council to share with both of those missionary couples that we as a church are going to financially support them and be praying for them. Isn't that wonderful? They can't wait to get on the field so that they can share the greatest message of all, the grace and the love found in Jesus Christ. And that should motivate us as well because we have received this unconditional love of God. Philip Yancey put it this way, there is nothing you can do to make God love you more. There is nothing he can do to make his love less for you. That's how it is. Freely here, freely today, freely given. Second of all, not only is God's love unconditional, but God's love is a sacrifice. It is sacrificial that he gave. That he gave. He gave, he served, and he sacrificed. Some people think that they themselves love other people by different things in their lives. We attribute love many times by, well, they must love me because they did this for me. We attribute it to these actions. Now, granted... We do show our love by our actions, but sometimes we just do things because, you know, it's the thing to do. But it's not, it's not motivated by love. It's not driven by love. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So yes, there is a demonstration of our life in obedience to God that tells him how much and it shows him how much we love him. Our children, when they, <clears throat> when they always obey, <laughs> grandkids, hey, so when they, always, yeah, when they obey, they're, they're showing something there. There's a demonstration that's going on there. We're told that children should what? Obey their parents. So there are those things that are expected of us but God is concerned about our love for Him. Go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You can do all kinds of these things. He starts to list them all there. But if you have not love, it's nothing. It means nothing. So it's not solely about what people do for other people or about how people feel about each other. You know, feelings can wane a lot. They really can, can't they? Subject of love, subject of, I've watched a lot of teenagers over the years. I was a youth pastor, some of you don't know it, for 12 years. I watched a lot of teenagers fall in love, fall out of love, fall in love. You know, it's like they, they fell in love over the weekend and by Tuesday they're not. And then by the next weekend they're back in love again. And they just, it's, it's a feeling kind of thing. It's just like a roller coaster. Yeah. That's just a different kind of love here, folks. It's not about just this, you know, goose pump feeling. Oh, I got the goosebumps, you know. It's more than that, isn't it? God shows you what true love is. It has nothing to do with what you can do for him, but everything what you or what he can do for you. What everything that he can do for you. That's the true love of God. And he did that, again, we're using the word, it says what? That he gave. There was a young banker named Stuart Briscoe. He said that when I was a banker, we used big leather ledgers where all accounts were entered by hand. You know, today we do everything on computer, don't we? Everything was done by hand. He goes on to say, 
I remember daydreaming about those ledgers and God's ledgers in heaven. How many think God's got ledgers in heaven? He does, folks. He's got books and things are recorded. We are told God's ledgers in heaven or those books will someday be opened. So David Stewart Briscoe says, I imagined my name. And God was busy adding up the sum total of my indebtedness against him. How many of you know we have an indebtedness that needs to be forgiven, right? I could never cancel the overwhelming indebt indebtedness by myself. In my eye, mind's eyes, I saw God take his pen and transfer, though, I saw this. Transfer the sum total of my indebtedness to the account of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the account of the Lord Jesus Christ, he wrote these words, transferred from the account of David Stewart Briscoe. I thought God was then finished. But then I saw him do something very incredible. He added up the total righteousness of Christ and beside it, he wrote these words, transferred to the account of David Stuart Briscoe. Folks, that's what love is. The total righteousness of God through his son Jesus Christ has been transferred to you. How could this be? How can this be that I can be a righteous man? You know what the Scripture says. My own righteousness is as filthy rags. How can I come before the Father? How can I raise my hands this morning and worship Him? How can I do any of these things except that not only has He loved you and He loves you today and you receive His love and all the indebtedness is gone. He removes it far away from the east as the west. It's gone, forgiven, forgotten. But He also puts upon you the clothing of the righteousness of Christ. Remember that. We're clothed with His righteousness. And it was nothing that you could ever do to earn it, to pay for it, to do anything except to receive it. That's why we can come boldly before the throne of grace to find help and strength in our time of need, right? You don't come boldly before Him in yourself. Look what I can do. I've been really good this week. I think God will listen. Come on now. It's nothing about that. It's all about His grace, His love for you. Yes, God's love to you is sacrificial. And so we also, as we apply this truth, we ask ourselves, how are we being able to show that kind of love to other people today? You know, the ultimate is what Jesus said. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. So we have a job to do. We have a responsibility to do. We get to, not have to, we get to sacrifice for Christ his love so that others would come to know him. Amen? Now here we go. Next point. God's love is valuable. His only. He gave His only. Yes, folks, this speaks to value. Have you ever had just one thing? And it's your treasured thing, and you're like, nobody's going to have this. This is mine. People put it in a case. They put it up on a counter. They put it up on the wall. This is the one and only. And you protect it with your life. This is the value of the Father's love for you. Not only was he willing to give, but we see here that he was willing to give the only one he had, <coughs> his only son. Let's be clear about the value of giving. When you give to someone <clears throat> out of your abundance, that's one thing. Oh, we've been abundantly blessed. Oh, I think we can give this and this and this, and, and we still have all of this to keep for ourselves for a rainy day. 
right? You don't want to touch the stuff for the rainy day. You can, you can give the rest because that's, that's extra abundance, but that's one thing that's not the same. It's not the same when you give out of your poverty. That's quite something different. Think about that. Chew on that for a moment. But here's, a, here's an example. This is how you can see it, and I, and I like this kind of analogy. I like this kind of way of looking at it. Let's say you have seven vehicles. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? I don't know if I'd like the insurance and the, and the gas. And Okay, that's, that's pretty. Oh, he's got a fleet in his yard. So that doesn't apply to most of us here, I don't think. It might seem an honorable thing if you were to give one of them to a family who had none. Hey, I got extra vehicles parked in my yard. Here, you can have one. I've got extra. No, no big deal. Just take it. That's one less thing I have to insure. That's great, you know. Take it with you. I don't have to repair it or anything. But if you were to give them the only vehicle you had, that would be seen as something more than honorable, something above and beyond even the call of duty, because you need one, right? It would be seen as a real sacrifice. For God so loved you that he gave his only son value. That's what we're talking about when we talk about love. He gave his only for you. Whew. That's a lot to sink in. If no one else, you've heard it said, some of you, if no one else was on this planet but you and you were in that sinful place, he would do this for you. Here's what we know about God. He didn't have a backup plan. God didn't have a spare. He so loved us that he was willing to give us the only one, his one and only. The King James says what? The only begotten of the Father. This again speaks to this power and passion and involvement of God's love toward you this morning. Have you received his love this morning? This amazing love. Oh God, I need you today. How many you need him today? I need him. And he values me. And he values you because he is your heavenly father. Number four, God's love is personable. John, who is writing this, calls him son. Son. God's love was made manifest in the world through the person of Jesus Christ, the only son of the Father. You see, Jesus Christ coming into this world was to reveal to us the love of God in human form. Emmanuel. God with us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He dwelt among us, the Word of God, the light of the world, the, the Father Himself allowing this world to see how much He truly loves us. And he came in a very personable way. He came in human form. He walked among us. Philippians 2, he took upon himself the very nature of a servant. Go back and read Philippians 2 and the humility. He left his father's glory to come and walk among us. How great is the personableness of the love of God. A child was once trying to quote from John 3.16 in the King James Version. Now, by the way, I, re I learned it that way when I was a child. Again, referencing a moment ago, the only begotten son. But the child misquoted it and said, his only forgotten son. <laughs> Whoops. It was one little slips of the tongue that carried more truth than many would care to admit, though. For most people in the world today, Jesus Christ is truly forgotten. 
For some folks, all he is is an, a word that's used inappropriately, swearing and such. That should grieve your heart. It's God's gift. His life, his love, is not forgotten. His sacrifice for you and for me is not forgotten. It is our job as Christians, as Christ's ambas ambassadors, to remember this uh, and to proclaim who he truly is. Let me share with you a true story. Joe, this gentleman Joe here, no Joe here, okay? Joe was a drunk. Okay, so Joe, we're good, right? Where you at, Joe? Okay, maybe I should have chose a different name in the story. Okay. Uh, miraculously converted in a street outreach mission. Before his conversion, he gained a reputation as a derelict and dirty wino for whom there was no hope. But following his conversion to Christ, everything changed. Joe became the most caring person at the mission. He spent his days there doing whatever needed to be done. There, were never, there was never anything he was asked to do that he didn't consider beneath him. Whether it was cleaning up vomit left by the sick alcoholic, scrubbing toilets after men had left them filthy, Joe did it all with a heart of gratitude. He could be counted on to feed any man who wandered in off the streets, undress and tuck them into bed. When he was too out of out of it to take care of himself, or when others were too out of it to take care of themselves. One evening, after the missions director delivered his evangelistic message to the usual crowd of sullen men and drooped heads, one of them looked up, came down to the altar, and kneeled to pray, crying out for God to help him change. The repentant drunk kept shouting, Oh God, Oh, God, make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. The director leaned over and said, Son, wouldn't it be better if you prayed, Make me like Jesus? Make me like Jesus? After thinking about it for a few moments, the man looked up with an inquisitive expression and said these words and asked to the missions director, is he like Joe? <laughs> the innocence of someone who had never really known. How about you? Are you like Jesus? Does your love reflect that? The way you act, the way you respond, the genuineness of your heart, the sacrifice of your life. How about it, my friend? Wouldn't that be something if someone would say, is he like, and put your name in there. God's love is personable. Max Lucado writes about the, God's love being personable, and here's what Max Lucado says. There are many reasons God saves you, to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because he is fond of you. He likes having you around. He thinks you're the best thing to come down the pike in quite a while. Have you ever heard the phrase, Max Lucado, he coined it. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Have you heard that from him? He also said this, if you, have a, if you had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he's ready to listen. Aren't you thankful you don't get put on hold? Don't you hate those calls? You're number five in the queue. Oh, boy. We all know what that's like. You don't have to get put in the queue. You just call him, and there you are. He's talking. I just love it when I can just pause and say, Father, please talk to me. I love you, and I need you. And when you're in tune with God and walking in His Spirit, He talks to you. He's personable with you. And you don't have to wonder, is it me? No, it's God, and He speaks. He ends with this quote. He said, just so you know, friend, 
He's crazy about you. That's why he loves you so much. Number five, moving right along. Are you with me? We're getting there. God's love is accessible. That whoever believes in him. What does that mean? It's not limited to just a few. Not available only to those who were born with the right color of skin or the correct continent. The mission field, hey, it don't matter. It's not rewarded. Reserved, rather, for only the intellectual elite or the power brokers or the financial wizards. It's not difficult to obtain. A child can come to him. Maybe many of you are like me. I was a child, eight years old. And I still remember the night. Fifty years ago, this last December, I've been walking with Jesus for 50 years. And I still remember the night as an eight-year-old finding my way to an altar. Dad, you were there with me. There's no greater joy than I guess to have a dad with his child giving their heart to Jesus, but it can happen at camp, it can happen in Sunday school, it can happen in Sunday church, but it was very special for us. And I prayed and asked Jesus into my life. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. I'm so thankful for his love. He loves me more and more. I think that's part of the chorus too. Oh, my friend. His love is accessible to child, to children as well, to the average ordinary person like you and me. He's not a distant God who loves us only from some mystical faraway place that is completely removed from you. Rather, he entered into your world. He longs to enter into your life. It is the ultimate expression of God's love to you today through His Son. Number six, God's love is non-judgmental. You know, He sent His Son to die for you so that you should not perish. And there's a word we don't like to use much. What do you mean about perishing? You've got to understand something. The wages of your sin is death. It is separation from God. Listen, you can't avoid eternity. No one here can avoid eternity. Either heaven or hell. By the way, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. God wants you with him. God wants you to know that your sins are forgiven. Oh, God wants you to know the peace and the joy and the rest in knowing that everything is right between you and God. And if you're in a place today where that's not true, you're wrestling this morning with a decision to make. Choose today to give your life to Jesus. Choose today to surrender. He's a non-judgmental God that we serve. You see, many times we'll quote John 3.16, but we forget John 3.17. For God sent not His Son into the world to this ungodly multitude to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God even gave that multitude during the days of Noah all kinds of opportunity to get right and get on the ark. But they refused. It says for those who miss this opportunity, the book of Revelation tells us they refused to know the truth and to be saved. When you see that sign and that placard and that poster, John 3.16, as we're almost through this message this morning. Remember, it is a message that demonstrates and shares how much God loves the lowest of sinners and even the most pious of the religious. It's not by works, but by the grace of God that you make heaven. He shows us his love to rescue you not to rebuke you, 
to cleanse you, not criticize you, to pardon you, not to punish you, to deliver you, not destroy you. God, on the other hand, will again, will judge us for sins, yes, as I mentioned a moment ago, and even the sentence is hell, separation, but only as a last resort. You've seen me do this many times in my sermons. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man open up his heart, he opens up, I'll sup with him and he with me. There is a knocking on the door of hearts across this ungodly world right now from every church where the pastor is preaching about Jesus and salvation all across this world, whether it's in the nighttime or the daytime, whether it's in a home far away where some of our missionaries have to meet in secret, whether it's in the big crusades, wherever it is, the Lord is knocking. You can hear the sound, my friend, of the Lord knocking on the doors of hearts that will respond to His love, respond to His forgiveness, Forgiveness. And here we are with no excuse because we've heard the message and it's time to respond. Finally, as we realize it's a choice, God's love brings eternal reward, but have eternal life. When thinking about how showing God's love is this way, I came across another uh, true story. There was a young man who had quarreled with his father when his fa excuse me with his father and he left home. So he continued to keep in touch with his mother but wanted very badly after a while he just felt like he wanted to come back home for Christmas. But he was afraid his father would not allow him. His mother wrote to him and urged him to come home, but he did not feel he could until he knew his father had forgiven him. Finally, there was no time for any more letters. His mother wrote and said she would talk with the father. And if he had forgiven him, she would tie a white cloth on the tree which grew right alongside the railroad tracks near their home, which he could see before the train reached the station. If there were no white cloth, it would be better if he went home, or not home, went on and not come home. So the young man started home. As the train drew near his home, he was so nervous, he said to his friend who was traveling with him, I can't bear to look. Sit in my place by the window and, and, and look out the window, would you? I'll tell you what the tree looks like, and you tell me whether there's a white cloth on it or not. So his friend changed places with him and began to look out the window as they were nearing the place where the train was to stop. After a bit the friend said, the friend said, "Oh yes. I see the tree." The son asked, "Is there a white cloth tied to it?" For a moment the friend did not say anything. Then he turned and in a gentle voice said these words, There is a white cloth tied to every limb of that tree. Now I've read that story before, but every time I read it, it chokes me up. That's how much he loves you. Does it matter? Does it matter how many times you feel like you've failed him. And I'm going, to speak, I'm going to speak right now to every one of us, followers of Jesus Christ or not. Sometimes we just don't feel like we deserve it. Do I deserve this, Lord? I come to you again and again, and I ask you for help. I help you to change me. And Lord, you know my struggle. You know we all struggle at times in our lives, and sometimes we have seasons of things that we face, and, and granted, these things, are, are, these things happen. The disciples were no different. Jesus had to rebuke them. But he loved them so, and he loves us. And this morning, I ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've made your decision, and you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, what are you going to do with this love now? How are you living it out? 
These are seven things you can take and apply to your own life because God has told us to do just as, just as how he did through our own life because if it wasn't for Christ, you'd be dead. <laughs> you wouldn't be here. You would be lost. But we're found because he left the 99 and he came after you. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, now's the time. Don't wait another moment from the children downstairs who are, are many are so, they're old enough they can accept Jesus Christ. They can understand. Some of you know what it meant to give your heart to Christ when you were young. Teenager. Adult. No matter of our age. Let's come back to his love this morning. I want you to bow your heads. We're going to sing and pray in just a moment. And we're going to open the altar. And we're going to come and sing one more time around the altar. And, and this is a good time for all of us. They're going to dismiss the older kids. And they're going to come upstairs and join us. And, and they're going to start playing. And that's going to be their cue for downstairs. Would you bow your heads with us this morning? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word that you gave me again and stirred within my heart again to share on this Sunday morning. Father, I felt so strongly in my spirit that this was a word that needed to be shared today. You know why? Because God knew all of us would be here today. He knew each and every one of us and that this was the word that he had for you. This word wasn't for somebody else here. Oh, yes, for all of us, but don't have that mindset. This word was for you. Are you here today? Hey, Pastor, I'm going to be honest. There are times in my life, and maybe even right now, that you have struggled with realizing and understanding how much God truly loves you because there's stuff happening in your life and you're like, Lord, do you really love me? Have you been struggling with, has anybody here been struggling with that? Raise your hand high, just put it up. Say, God, that's me. That's me for several of you. Raise your hand. Bless you. Yes, Lord. Do you really love me? Oh, I pray that this word this morning has spoken to your heart. Doesn't matter what we've done or where we're at right now. Nothing can separate you. He loves you. Receive that. He's calling you by your name. Yes, he is.